five nights at Freddy's. Fazbear Frights. Number seven. Story one. The Cliffs. Tyler knocked his sippy cup off the kitchen table. Again. Careful, buddy, Robert said, picking it up and setting it in front of his son. Robert tried to feel relieved that his already well-worn copy of How to Handle the Toddly Years, which he jokingly called the owner's manual, assured him that it was perfectly normal for toddlers to knock over cups, throw food, and demonstrate an often overwhelming amount of emotional instability. But just because it was normal didn't mean it was easy. Play phone? Tyler said, eyeing Robert's phone on the table. Robert set a bowl of cereal and bananas in front of Tyler. It's not time for you to play with Daddy's phone. It's time for you to eat your breakfast and get ready for daycare. Tyler, distracted by his bowl of Cheerios, sliced banana, and sippy cup of milk, began happily eating. That's another thing about two-year-olds, Robert thought. Their emotions can turn on a dime. When Robert had last taken Tyler to the pediatrician, he had unloaded on her about Tyler's wild mood swings. The pediatrician had just laughed and said, Welcome to parenthood. She had then promised him, as she always did, that the task of parenting would get easier as Tyler got older. But when would it get easier? When Tyler was three? When he was old enough to start school? When he was in college? Robert knew that for him, the hardest thing about parenting was that it was something he had to do alone. He had never planned to be a single parent, but he had no choice now that Anna was gone. Robert had met Anna his junior year in college. He had never believed in the finding the one theory of romance. Surely there wasn't just one person in the whole world who was right for you. And yet his and Anna's connection was immediate. They loved the same books and movies, and when they started having more serious conversations, they discovered that they shared deeper values too. They dated through the rest of college and got engaged right after graduation, agreeing on a one-year engagement to give them some time to get used to being real grown-ups with real jobs before they got married. Robert settled into a steady but not terribly exciting job with a local lifestyle magazine, and Anna got a position as a first grade teacher. They got married barefoot on the beach, and both sets of their parents chipped in to help them out with a down pavement on a house. The little bungalow had seen better days, but it still had plenty of charm, especially for young, energetic, first-time homeowners who were willing to put some elbow grease into renovating it. The only downside, as far as Robert was concerned, was the house's location, right next to the town's most notorious geographical feature, the cliffs. Although these rocky outcroppings possessed a rugged beauty, they also had a grisly history. The highest of them was nicknamed Jumpers Cliff by the locals because it was a common site for suicides over the generations. It seemed that everyone knew of someone who had chosen to end it all at the cliffs. The jilted high school homecoming queen from Robert's mother's generation. The businessman who lost all his money due to bad investments. The grandmother with a terminal cancer diagnosis. There were stories about the cliffs that were fact and stories that were fiction. But true or not, these tales made people look at the geological features with a mixture of fear and awe, especially Jumper's Cliff. Teenagers gathered there and creeped each other out with scary stories. Younger kids whispered that the ghosts of the departed still haunted the place where they had chosen to make that final leap. Robert had grown up hearing those stories and the cliffs creeped him out. Anna insisted that, while the suicides themselves were sad, the cliffs were just rocks. They didn't really mean anything. Besides, the house's proximity to the cliffs was why it had been such a steal. 
attributing any dark meaning to the cliffs. It was nothing short of superstition. Robert knew she was right, and once they moved into the house, he would be so happy with his new wife and his new life that he hardly thought about the cliffs at all. When he looked back on it, the first year of their marriage was a blissful blur of love and laughter. In his mind, he could play out scenes from that first year like a montage in a romantic movie. The two of them riding bikes together, cooking dinner together, cuddling in front of the TV with a big bowl of popcorn between them. Sure, one of them would sometimes have a bad day at work or come down with a cold, but these problems were minuscule compared to the happiness they took in each other's company. Although the first year of their marriage had been great, the happiest time in Robert's life had come when Anna was pregnant with Tyler. They'd been married two years when they found out she was pregnant, and they were both over the moon with delight. There was something about the idea that they had created a new human being because of their love. It seemed almost magical. As happy as they had been as a couple, they knew they would be an even happier family. Throughout Anna's pregnancy, she'd glowed like some kind of ancient mother goddess from mythology. Robert had glowed too, so full of love he didn't know what to do with all of it. He massaged Anna's feet when they were sore after she came home from teaching all day. He went out to fetch her mint chocolate chip ice cream when she said it was the only thing in life that could possibly satisfy her cravings. They were in perfect harmony during her pregnancy. Two dedicated gardeners growing their baby together. But then things went wrong. Two months before the baby was due, Anna started complaining of swelling in her hands and feet. When she called the nurse at the obstetrician's office, she had said not to worry about it. That swelling was common among pregnant women, especially in the hottest months of the summer. Reassured, Anna had bought bigger shoes and soaked her feet in Epsom salts and otherwise ignored her symptoms. But when she went in for her regular checkup, but when she went in for her regular checkup, her blood pressure was so alarmingly high that the doctor insisted that she be admitted to the hospital immediately. After that, things were a nightmarish blur in Robert's mind. All the IV drugs the doctors gave her in a failed attempt to bring her blood pressure down. The decision to deliver the baby early by cesarean section in hopes of saving her life. The massive stroke she suffered on the operating table that left Robert a single father. For a long time, he was numb. None of it even felt real. Since Tyler was born early, he was tiny and unable to breathe on his own without exhausting himself. He had to stay in the hospital for a few weeks until he gained weight and his lungs developed more. In his shocked days, Robert would visit his new baby in the neonatal intensive care unit. He would scrub his hands and put on a face mask before entering the brightly lit white room lined with plastic incubators in which impossibly tiny babies lay. Robert would stand by his own son's incubator and look at Tyler's small, skinny body, wearing a diaper the size of a fast food napkin. The parents of our other babies in the NICU always looked tired and worried like Robert did, but they arrived in couples, so at least they had each other. In a horror, Robert would look at his son and think, Kid, I'm all you have in this world. It was not a good way to start out in life. Motherless and stuck with a father who couldn't eat, sleep, or go a full hour without crying. In his exhausted, grief-stricken state, there were only two facts Robert knew for sure. One, he was all that Tyler had. Two, he was not enough. Robert had muddled through the last two years, managing to hold down his job somehow and provide Tyler with food, clothing, and shelter. Robert had withdrawn from his friends because he didn't want their pity, and because for a single father of a toddler, grabbing a bite to eat after work with his buddies was not an option. At five o'clock sharp, 
she needed to leave the office to pick up Tyler from daycare. After that, it was time to go home and fix his supper. Then came playtime and bath time, and if Robert was lucky and Tyler would actually fall asleep, bedtime. The toddler owner's manual was clear. Without a regular schedule, life with the toddler descended into chaos. Robert had quite enough chaos in his life, so he tried not to deviate from the daily schedule. Once Tyler was finally asleep, Robert mindlessly surfed through the channels on TV or played Worry's Way on his laptop. Sometimes Bartholomew, the orange cat, sat with him, but most often he did not. Bartholomew had been Anna's pet before she and Robert had married, and Anna used to refer to him jokingly as my first husband because of the way he guarded her jealousy and had never warmed up to Robert. Now, with Anna gone, Bartholomew would accept food or the occasional pat from Robert, but he never gave Robert the impression that he was doing anything more than tolerating him because he was the dispenser of cat food. Was Robert lonely? Yes, painfully so, but he was also too busy and exhausted to do anything about it. After Tyler's bedtime, he allowed himself two or three hours of mindless screen time of one kind or another until he fell into bed himself, knowing that he was going to wake up to a day that was nearly identical to the one before, with the type and duration of Tyler's mood swings being the only wild card. Right now, though, as Tyler was contentedly picking up Cheerios and stuffing them in his mouth, he was adorable. His hazel eyes, the same shade as Anna's, were framed by long, sooty eyelashes. His curly black hair surrounded his head like a halo, and his mouth was a cherubic rosebud, also like his mom's. In fact, Tyler resembled his mother so much that it made Robert's head hurt. Looking at his son, Robert felt overwhelmed by love, but also by fear. What if he lost Tyler like he'd lost Anna? Over and over, the what-ifs playing on the screen of his mind like a trailer for a movie no one would ever want to see. Even though Robert couldn't look at Tyler without thinking of Anna, he never talked to Tyler about her. Tyler was too young to understand death, and Robert wasn't doing such a great job of understanding himself. In his heart, he knew it would probably be a good idea to start showing Tyler pictures of his mom and telling him little stories about the kind of person she was, the things she used to say and do, how excited she had been about becoming his mommy. But he could never bring himself to take out any of the pictures of Anna hiding in the attic. If he tried to talk about her, the words stuck in his throat and said nothing. Even saying his name hurt too much, especially because when he looked at Tyler, he was staring into Anna's eyes. Like he did every weekday morning, Robert chalked back his sadness along with some black coffee and drove Tyler to daycare, letting him play with his phone all the way. After he had dropped off Tyler, he went to work, only nodding at colleagues who greeted him with good morning. He didn't want to seem rude, but he didn't want to get into a conversation either. His own reactions were too unpredictable. Once he started talking, what would he say? Would he get all emotional in front of someone he didn't even know very well? Would he break down entirely? And if he did break down, what if he wasn't able to put the pieces back together? Robert knew that no matter how bad he felt, he had to hold onto his job. It was the only way he could make any kind of life a Tyler. And so today, like every other day, he sat at his cubicle and worked without stopping, trying to empty his mind of everything but the task in front of him. He stopped at noon and took out a sandwich, eating it so mindlessly that once he finished it, he couldn't even have identified what kind of sandwich it had been. He walked to the bathroom, then to the water cooler, he was refilling his water bottle when a voice behind him said, Hey! 
He jumped as though startled that he wasn't the only person in the building. He turned around to see Jess, the nice, bespectacled copy editor and self-confessed grammar nerd who had been hired at the same time he was. She and he used the chat a bit before Anna died, before he was broken. Hey Jess, he said, moving away to let her have a turn at the water cooler, and he hoped to get back to his desk without being disturbed further. He turned to walk away. Hold up a sec, Jess said. Me? Robert said. Even though it was clearly him she was talking to, reluctantly he turned around. I was just noticing you eating your sad little sandwich at your desk. Jess filled up one of those weird paper cones with water from the cooler. Who had decided that those were adequate drinking vessels? She grinned at him. Well, maybe it was a delicious sandwich, but it looked sad to me. And I was thinking, I know you can't go out after work because you got a kid to fetch, but a lot of us go out for a half-priced sushi on Wednesdays at lunch. Maybe you could go with us sometime. Sushi had been Robert and Anna's favorite food. They had learned to love it in college, and had also learned to use chopsticks together, picking up sushi rolls, dunking them in soy sauce, and popping them into each other's mouths. While a lot of couples went out for steaks, or seafood, or Italian, for special occasions, for them, it was always sushi. How could going out for half-priced sushi with a bunch of random people from work live up to all those romantic sushi dinners with Anna. The answer was simple, it couldn't. It would only bring back memories to make him sadder. Still, Jess was nice for asking him, for taking pity on him. Yeah, maybe I'll join you sometime, Robert said, not even trying to sound convincing. Thanks for inviting me. Okay, Jess said, sounding surprisingly disappointed. Robert? Yeah? He didn't know where this was going, but already knew he didn't like it. Wasn't this a workplace? Shouldn't they be working? She looked down for a minute like she was collecting her thoughts. You know, she began, before things changed so much for you, you and I used to be friends. We used to talk. If you ever want to talk again, I'm here. Robert knew he was in danger of his emotions bubbling up to the surface, which couldn't happen. He couldn't be a basket case at work. He had to get out of this conversation and get back to his desk. That's very kind. Jess rolled her eyes. I'm not being kind, you goof. I like you. I've always enjoyed your company. And I'm a single parent too. Not for the same reasons you are, maybe. But I bet we still go through a lot of the same stuff. Talking about some of it might be good for your sanity. What's left of it? Robert felt himself smile a little. Against his will, he was remembering why he had liked Jess. I am down to crumbs myself, he said. It was a joke, but like a lot of jokes, it contained the truth. I hear you, and who knows? Maybe our kids could hang out. We could take turns watching each other's rugrats, so we could maybe have an evening out every once in a while. Don't make any promises. You haven't met my kid yet, Robert said. Had he just made two jokes in a row? He's two, right? Yes. Well, maybe I should give it a year or two before I offer my babysitting services. She smiled at him, a warm, genuine smile. Listen, I am giving you a free pass this week, but next Wednesday, you're going out for half-priced sushi with us. No more said little sandwiches for you. Robert gave her a little wave. I will consider your invitation. Thank you. He tended to go back to his cubicle. It's not an invitation, Jess called behind him. It's mandatory. Mandatory sushi. Which would be a great name for a band, by the way. Robert sat back down at his cubicle. He was pretty sure that his conversation with Jess was the longest conversation he had had with a non-family member in months. Like someone who hasn't exercised in years and suddenly finds himself back on the treadmill. He was exhausted. No more chit-chat today. He stayed at his desk, 
where he worked non-stop until five. When it was time to leave, he felt no sense of relief. He was simply moving from one series of tasks in one location to another series of tasks in another. Off went the graphic designer hat, on went the dead hat. Robert pulled into the parking lot of Tiny Tot Academy and went into the cheerful red-roofed building to fetch his son. He entered the room with the big red number two on the door. The walls were peppered with construction paper cutouts and unintentionally abstract crayon and scribble drawings. Robert found Tyler's bubbly young teacher, Miss Lauren, surrounded by toddlers playing with the brightly colored toys that cluttered the floor, while being outnumbered by volatile little people seemed terrifying to Robert. Miss Lauren looked perfectly at home and greeted Robert with a smile. She stood up to get closer to Robert's eye level. He was a happy boy for most of today, she said, though there is one little thing I should tell you about. Robert braced himself for bad news. He hoped Tyler hadn't hit some other kid, or bitten somebody. It seemed like every daycare had one kid who was the biter. Nobody wanted to be the biter's parent. Miss Lauren smiled again. Don't worry, he didn't attack anybody or anything. Robert let himself breathe a little. Miss Lauren pushed back her curly brown hair behind her ears. It was just that today I asked the kids to draw pictures of their families and talk about them. Being two, most of them just drew blobs or scribbles. But then we sat in a circle and everybody talked about their families and who was in their pictures. Tyler's friend Noah noticed Tyler didn't have a mom in his picture and asked him about it. Tyler got a little upset. I think mostly because someone pointed out his family was different. Robert hated to think of Tyler being singled out because of his loss. Did that kind of behavior have to start so early? Aren't these kids a little young to even notice that kind of thing? He asked. He looked around at the toddlers in the room, playing with blocks or trucks or dolls. They were babies, really. Miss Lauren smiled again. Oh, you'd be surprised what they notice. They don't miss much, believe me. I told Noah and the rest of the class that not all kids have a mommy and a daddy. And they're all different kinds of family. And I talked about what some of those families might look like. I said the only thing you need to have to make a family is people and love. So I guess you could say it turned into a teachable moment. Robert stiffened. He hated the thought of his and Tyler's broken little family being used as a teachable moment. And for what? So the other kids could feel sorry for Tyler instead of just making fun of him? He didn't want his son to be the object of ridicule. But he didn't want him to be an object of pity either. But there was no point in saying anything negative to Miss Lauren. She was so young and bright-eyed and idealistic that criticizing her would be like kicking a friendly puppy. He finally heard himself say, Thank you for letting me know. It sounded stiffer and more formal than necessary. But at least it was polite. You're welcome, Miss Lauren said. I just thought I should say something in case, you know, you wanted to talk about it with Tyler at home. Right, Robert said. He didn't want to talk about it, not at home with his son, and definitely not here with the near stranger. You ready to go, buddy? He called to Tyler from across the brightly decorated room. Tyler looked up from the plastic dump truck he was rolling back and forth and said, Daddy! He grinned, jumped up, and ran to Robert, his arms outstretched. See, Miss Lauren said, a happy boy. Robert had a hard time taking comfort in this statement. If Tyler was a happy boy, it was only because he didn't yet understand what he was missing. Robert didn't really want to stop for groceries on the way home. But he didn't see any way around it. Robert didn't care much about eating, but he knew that if nothing else, he had to make sure his kid's basic needs were met. Once he got Tyler safely strapped into his car seat, he said, We need to stop at the store on the way home, buddy. We're out of milk and juice. Toddlers run on milk and juice the way cars run on gasoline. 
They had to have it. And they bent their way through it at an alarming and expensive rate. Milk! Dudes! Tyler said. That's right. We'll buy some at the store. You can pick what kind of juice you want. Bapple! Tyler sang. For some reason, when he said the word apple, it came out with a B at the beginning. You want apple juice? Robert said. This was the way the toddler owner's manual said to handle kids in mispronunciations. Not to call attention to them, but to make sure you repeated the word correctly. Yeah! Bapple doos! Tyler cheered. You got it, buddy. Robert turned into the Armart parking lot and prepared himself for the ordeal of shopping. Tyler owned one t-shirt with Freddy Fazbear on it, but Robert had never thought of his son as a Freddy fanatic. He was too little, for one thing. As he pushed Tyler in the shopping cart past the toy aisles, though, Tyler pointed his index finger and yelled, Freddy! at the top of his tiny lungs. What was that, buddy? Robert asked, looking around to see what Tyler was seeing. For a second, he thought Freddy was a kid Tyler recognized from daycare. Freddy! Freddy! Tyler yelled, his eyes wide with excitement. Robert followed the line of his son's pointing finger to a display of identical plush brown bears with wide smiles, thick black eyebrows, and black top hats. The packaging proclaimed that what Tyler was looking at was a toy called Tagalong Freddy. But how did Tyler know that? With a surge of guilt, Robert realized how Tyler most likely knew. When Robert was especially exhausted or too sad to cope, and this happened more often than he would like to admit, he would plop Tyler down in front of the TV. He only let him watch age-appropriate programming and the cartoons, while there were no doubt eye candy with bright colors and rapidly shifting images that at least make a pretense of having some educational value. But then there were the commercials, the terrible, terrible commercials designed by boardrooms of cynical suits on Madison Avenue to make children desire Technicolor, sugar blobs, masquerading as cereal, high fructose corn syrup suspensions, masquerading as juice drinks, and the latest toys based on the most popular of pop culture trends. You want to look at one of the Freddies? Robert asked. Tyler nodded and held out his hands. Robert placed a toy in Tyler's hands, and Tyler's mouth spread into a beautiful smile that conjured the ghost of his mother. Even though the bear was encased in cardboard packaging, he drew it to him in a hug. Wove, he said. Well, shoot, Robert thought. It was hard to agree with Wove. Now, you be careful with that bear, Robert said. We haven't decided if we're going to buy it. When he looked at the price sticker, he was surprised how expensive it was. Yikes, he muttered. Bye? Tyler asked, still clutching the toy to his chest. Mine? Well, let me read the packaging and see if it's even safe for kids your age, Robert said. He pulled another bear off the shelf and turned it over. The pictures on the back of the box showed laughing toddlers playing with Tagalong Freddy, and, interestingly, a woman dressed like she worked in an office, looking at her wristwatch and smiling like all was well in the world. Robert read the text on the back of the package. Tag along Freddy is a kid's and parent's best pal. Freddy goes where your little one goes and sends you live updates on your tag along time wristwatch, wristwatch included, so you'll know your little one is happy and safe. You may have to be out of sight sometimes, but tag along Freddy is the bear who is always there. Robert thought of all the times he had to tend to something in the kitchen, or take an important phone call and leave Tyler unattended. It was amazing what could go wrong in just a few seconds. He recalled once when he left the living room long enough to stare a pot on the stove, and returned to find Tyler scaling the bookcase like King Kong climbing the Empire State Building. He could see how this tag-along Freddy could come in handy, especially for a single parent like him. When he took into account that it was a toy 
that was also a safety device. The price didn't seem too outrageous. Tyler, he said, would you like to take Freddy home with you? Tyler's whole face lit up in a beautiful smile. Yeah, Daddy, thank you. Miss Lauren at daycare had told Robert they had been working on pleases and thank yous, but this was the first time he had ever heard Tyler say thank you without being prompted by a what do we say. You're welcome, buddy, and I'm loving those good manners. Getting the bear and wristwatch set up and working was mildly annoying, but could have been worse. After about 15 minutes of fussing with the directions and batteries, Robert had everything in working order. He handed the bear over to Tyler and said, Why don't you play with Freddy while I get our supper started? Freddy! Tyler said, giving the bear a hug. In the kitchen, Tyler put on a pot of water to boil and dumped the contents of a jar of spaghetti sauce into a pan. He was getting the lettuce, carrots, and cucumbers out of the fridge to start a salad when his tag-along Freddy time wristwatch vibrated. The screen said, a message from Freddy. Robert tapped the screen and a text appeared. It's all good. I am playing with my best buddy. Cute. Robert couldn't help but smile. Robert sliced carrots and cucumbers for the salad and put the pasta on to boil. When he went in the living room to tell Tyler it was time to eat, the little boy was holding Freddy on his lap and reading to him from one of his little board books, my first book of colors. Every time Tyler did something this adorable, Robert wished Anna was here to see it. But who was he kidding? He always wished Anna was here. I Freddy's daddy, Tyler said. You are, huh? That's pretty cool, Robert said. Are you and Freddy ready for supper? Robert expected at least a small argument since Tyler was in the middle of reading. But he said, Okay, Daddy. Tucked his bear under his arm and followed Robert to the kitchen. When he helped Tyler to his place at the table, Tyler set Freddy down in his chair next to him and said, Freddy plate! You want Freddy to have a plate too? Robert asked. Uh-huh, Tyler said, nodding like it was a very serious matter. Feeling more than a little silly, Robert set a plate and a cup at the spot on the table in front of the toy bear. He set down a plate of spaghetti and a bowl of salad in front of Tyler, along with a city cup of milk. Now Freddy has to just eat pretend food or he'll get all messy, Robert said. He'll eat pretend spaghetti. And then, because he knew rhymes cracked Tyler up, he said, Freddy Spaghetti! Tyler giggled like his dad had just made the funniest joke in the world. Freddy Sketty! He yelled, then laughed some more, slapping the table in hilarity. He's ready for Freddy Spaghetti! Robert said. He was milking the joke, but that's what you did when you had a two-year-old audience. There was not much occasion for subtle wit. Robert and Tyler ate spaghetti and salad and laughed a lot. Even Robert had to admit it was a fun time. The downside to feeding a toddler spaghetti was that it made a bath necessary pronto. Tyler's face was so smeared with orange goo that when he smiled, he looked like a jack-o'-lantern. Somehow, he had even managed to get noodles in his hair. Okay, buddy. Robert said, sealing himself in preparation for a tantrum. We're going to have to go straight to the bathtub after this. Freddy bath too? Tyler asked. Freddy can't get wet, but he can come along, Robert said. Okay, Daddy, Tyler said, picking up his bear and walking toward the bathroom. Talking Tyler into a bath usually involved such elaborate negotiations, Robert felt he should involve the United Nations. He couldn't believe tonight's routine was going so easy. It was funny though, as much as Tyler usually argued about bath time, once it was in the water, he loved it. Robert threw Tyler's collection of rubber duckies and toy boats in the water, and the boy was happy to splash and play. Robert set Freddy down 
on Tyler's toddler step stool, so he was at a safe distance from the splash zone, but Tyler could still see him. Tyler held up each of his tub toys to show to Freddy. Freddy, this my blue boat. Freddy, this my yellow ducky. Two-year-olds love to show off and brag about their material possessions. Robert had noticed. When Tyler talked to his grandma on the phone, most of what he said was a list of the toys he owned. It was like he was some kind of business tycoon, bragging about how many cars and houses he owned. After Tyler was clean and in his choo-choo trim pajamas, Robert tucked him into bed, with Tagalong Freddy. You want me to read you a book, buddy? Robert asked. Two books, Tyler said. Robert pretended to be aghast at such an outrageous request. Two books? Because I'm two, Tyler said. Like that explained everything. Well, I guess I can't argue with that. Robert scooted a chair next to Tyler's bed and looked over at Tyler's bookshelf. The silly chicken, Tyler said. Robert pulled out the book about the silly chicken. Do the voices, Tyler said. Robert read the book about the silly chicken, complete with silly chicken voices. Tyler giggled because the book was funny, but also, Robert suspected because it was hilarious to hear your parent making a fool of himself. Now the piggy one, Tyler said. Robert obeyed. By the end of the piggy story, Tyler's eyes were drooping. Seconds after Robert closed the book, Tyler wrapped his arm around his tagalong Freddy and went right to sleep. Robert couldn't believe how much easier the regular tasks of parenting had become with tagalong Freddy. He couldn't believe he almost didn't buy the bear because it had seemed too expensive. It would have been worth it at twice the price. Robert got a soda and a snack from the fridge and settled in to watch a dumb but fun action movie he'd missed because he never got to go to the theater anymore. He knew he could hire a sitter, but he already felt bad leaving Tyler in daycare all day. He wanted to spend all the time he could with him. The little boy had already been deprived of a mom. As a dad, Robert already felt he wasn't adequate or enough. The least he could do was try to be present all he could. Just like in school, even if you weren't great at it, you could generally get by if you put in some effort and showed up. It wasn't a great parenting philosophy, but it was one Robert could work with. As the movie's opening credits ran, Robert felt a buzz from his tag-along time wristwatch. The watcher's screen read, A message from Freddy. He tapped it and the text said, Fast asleep. Nice. Robert let himself relax. The movie was the exact kind of thing Anna would have hated. But Robert enjoyed the brainless entertainment of cars chasing each other and guns blazing. He knew he would have enjoyed the movie more if Anna had been beside him, making snarky comments about the improbability of the situations and the cheesiness of the acting. She'd always been very tolerant of him being equally snarky when they watched the romantic comedies she liked. Even with his ever-present loneliness, it was still one of those most relaxing nights he'd had in a long time. He knew he had Tagalong Freddy to thank for his easy evening. Tagalong Freddy accompanied Tyler to the breakfast table the next morning, and then went with him to daycare. Tyler didn't even ask to play with Robert's phone in the car. He cuddled Freddy and talked to him instead. When they arrived in the classroom, Miss Lawrence squatted on the floor to examine Tyler's new toy. Who is your friend? she asked. Freddy, Tyler said, sounding proud and delighted. He held the bat to Miss Lawrence's face, so it seemed to kiss her cheek. Miss Lawrence laughed. Freddy's very friendly. I know you usually discourage bringing toys from home, Robert said, but we got the bear yesterday, and he absolutely refuses to part with it. Miss Lawrence smiled and looked at Tyler, who was cuddling Freddy against his chest. It would be obvious to anyone how happy the toy made him. Well, then I think we can make an exception in this case. 
Robert knew the teachers at the daycare cut Tyler some slack because he didn't have a mom, just a sad but well-meaning dad who often seemed incompetent and overwhelmed. While on one hand, he didn't like being looked at with pity. On the other hand, he was happy to take all the breaks he could get. Every once in a while, as Robert worked in his cubicle, his tag-along Freddy time wristwatch would vibrate. He would tap it and read a text from Freddy. Messy fun with finger paints. Yum. Lunch time. Nap time. He's sizzing away. There was something comforting about those messages, about the way they let Robert picture what Tyler was doing over the course of his day. It made him feel less isolated, like he was part of something. A family. He and Tyler may not have been the complete family that Robert had longed for, but there was still a family. Just like Miss Lauren had explained the idea of family to Tyler's class, they were people who loved each other, and that had to count for something. Saturday morning after breakfast, Robert grabbed a second cup of coffee and helped Tyler down from his booster seat. It's a beautiful morning, buddy. Why don't we go outside and you can play in your sandbox? Yeah, sandbox, Tyler said. He grabbed his Freddy doll with one hand and his daddy's hand with the other. Freddy, play too. Okay, Robert said. Freddy can come too, but he can't get in the sandbox. The sand will be bad for his fur. Robert had settled into some kind of deal with the helpful inanimate object that was tag along Freddy. Freddy would give Robert regular updates on Tyler's safety and well-being. And in return, Robert would prevent Tyler from submerging Freddy in water, smearing him with spaghetti sauce, coating him in sand, or exposing him to any other messy form of peril. It was a mutually beneficial relationship. Outside, Tyler perched Tagalung Freddy on the side of the sandbox. Robert supposed it was so that Freddy could watch him play. Robert settled on a chair on the porch with his cup of coffee and watched Tyler play too. Tyler loved his sandbox. It was filled with toy dump trucks and bulldozers and other construction vehicles. Tyler loved taking his plastic shovel, filling his dump truck with sand, moving it around while making room sounds, and then dumping out the sand, only to fill it up again. It never got old, as far as Robert could tell. From inside the house, Robert heard his phone ringing. He had meant to bring it outside, but had left it on the kitchen counter. Parenting made him so scattered that it seemed he was always leaving something behind. Hey, buddy, I'm gonna go get the phone, Robert said. You stay in the sandbox, okay? Okay, daddy, Tyler said, shoveling sand into the bed of his dump truck. I'll be right back, Robert called. Robert ran into the kitchen and picked up his phone. The voicemail icon popped up, and he clicked on it. It was a recorded message from a sketchy-sounding company trying to sell him homeowner's insurance he didn't need. He deleted the message and headed back outside. The sandbox was empty. Fear gripped Robert's heart. Tyler! he yelled. Tyler! No answer. He ran up to the sandbox. He could see the indentation in the sand where Tyler had been sitting. But no Tyler. Tyler's tag-along Freddy still sat on the edge of the sandbox. Clearly, Freddy had not been watching. Robert looked at the open gate. It had been closed before, hadn't it? And saw a white van he didn't recognize driving away. Could Tyler be inside that van? It was the absolute worst thing he could imagine. Robert felt his tag-along Freddy time wristwatch vibrate. The watcher's screen announced a message from Freddy. He tapped the icon. A one-word message appeared on the screen. Gone. Gone? Robert screamed. Gone? How was that supposed to help me? He kicked the stuffed bear as hard as he could, sending it sailing across the yard. Tyler! Tyler! He yelled some more. 
He ran out into the street, yelling. Neighbors came out of the houses to ask what was wrong, but no one had seen his son. Could someone have opened the gate, come into the yard, and snatched his son in the few seconds it took him to go inside the house and grab his phone? It seemed impossible, and yet you saw that kind of thing on the news all the time. Those people had probably thought it was impossible too. The kind of thing that happened to other people. But not you. Until it did. His phone. He had forgotten he was still holding his phone. Time was wasting. He called the police. They arrived quickly. He'd given them that. There were two officers. An older man with salt and pepper hair. And a young dark haired woman. So at what time did you notice your son was missing? The younger officer asked. Her demeanor was professional, but Robert could still hear genuine concern in her voice. Her badge read Ramirez. Maybe 20 minutes ago, Robert said. He was so panicky he couldn't get his breath. He was in the sandbox. I ran into the house to get my phone, and when I came back, he was gone. And there's no chance you could have come into the house while you were getting your phone and then hidden somewhere. Some kids get a kick out of hiding, the old officer whose badge read a cook said. You'd be amazed how many kids I've found hiding under beds or in closets, giggling like crazy about how bad they've scared their mom and dad. No, I would have heard of him if he had come back in the house, Robert said. Also, the front gate was open when I came back. I'm pretty sure it was closed before, and I saw a white van on the street. I know it doesn't belong to anybody in the neighborhood. Maybe he was abducted by someone in that van. Officer Ramirez was taking notes furiously. Did you get the van's license plate number? No. It drove away too fast. I'm sorry. In fact, Robert hadn't even thought of trying to get the van's license plate number. You would think I'd never even seen a cop show on TV, he thought. I'm incompetent. I'm too incompetent to be a parent. And our Tyler is paying the price. That's okay, Officer Ramirez said. I know this is upsetting. I just need to go through all these questions so we'll have the information we need to find your son. Now, does your son's mother live with you? No. She died in childbirth having Tyler. If she weren't dead, Robert thought. Tyler probably wouldn't be missing because he at least would have had one competent parent. I'm sorry to hear that, Officer Ramirez said. Could you give us a physical description of your son? He's two years old, Robert said. Hazel eyes, dark hair. He's about three feet tall, and I think he weighed 28 pounds on his last doctor's visit. Conjuring up a vivid picture of Tyler made his disappearance all the more painful. Three feet tall and 28 pounds. He was so tiny, so helpless. Here, I can zoom you a picture of him. He fumbled with his phone. Can you tell us what clothing Tyler was wearing at the time of his disappearance? Officer Ramirez continued. What clothes had Robert picked out for Tyler this morning? He hadn't paid much attention because he wasn't anticipating being quizzed on them. Play clothes, blue shorts, I think, and a t-shirt with Freddy Fazbear on it. Saying the bear's name made him think painfully of the message on his wristwatch. Gone. He had to pull himself together. For Tyler's sake, red sneakers, he said. And he's still in diapers, if that matters. Tears sprang to his eyes. Tyler was still just a baby. Thank you, Officer Ramirez said. So, what are you going to do to find him? Robert asked. Officer Cook, who had seemed content to let his partner ask most of the questions, finally chimed in. Sir, when a child this young is missing, you can be sure it's not something we take lightly. We'll scour the entire area. We'll see if we can get an info about that van. And we'll be in touch. Right now, home is the best place for you to be, with your phone close by. Are you going to put out one of those alerts for missing children? Robert asked. He couldn't remember what the alerts were called, but he had got them on his phone with some frequency and always found them upsetting. He couldn't help imagining the frightened children, the frantic parents. Now he was one of those parents. An amber alert, the older officer said. 
We will if we don't find him quickly. And if we feel he's in any immediate danger. Of course he's in danger! Robert shouted. He's two years old, and he's either run off by himself or has been abducted by Maniac. How could he not be in danger? We understand you're upset, Officer Ramirez said, patting his arm. This is every parent's worst nightmare, but we're going to do everything in our power to get Tyler back to you as quickly as possible, safe and sound. It was 5 o'clock p.m., and there were still no leads. The police had assured him that they were asking around about the suspicious white van, but hadn't received any useful information yet. Robert sat on the couch, staring ahead in a daze. He had never felt so useless, so worthless. He only had one job that mattered, and that was to keep his son safe. He had failed miserably. Everyone he loved died or disappeared. He couldn't protect anyone, and now he was all alone. It probably served him right. Robert's wristwatch vibrated. He felt a sudden small flutter of hope. Maybe the watch had some information about Tyler's whereabouts. He tapped a message from Freddy. A text appeared. Why don't you go to the cliffs? Robert shivered as though the temperature in the room had dropped by 40 degrees. Jumper's Cliff. His own thoughts had been headed in that direction. Without Anna, without Tyler, what reason did he have to keep on living? Apparently, he was so worthless that even a child's toy thought he was a waste of good organs. Stop, Robert thought. Tyler hadn't even been missing for eight full hours. If he was still alive, Robert had to be there for him. He wasn't much, but he was all Tyler had. He would try to do better, try not to fail his son the next time. He looked over at the mantle where he had set the tag-along Freddy when he brought it back into the house. He knew it was ridiculous, but he felt like the bear was mocking him, judging him. Robert wasn't a superstitious person, but he couldn't shake the feeling that the toy was somehow bad luck. He grabbed it, holding it between his thumb and forefinger as if it were a dead rat. He carried it outside, lifted the lid on the garbage can, and dumped it inside. Back in the house, Robert sat back down on the couch. Normally at this time, he'd be thinking about what he and Tyler could have for supper. Usually on Saturdays, he made something simple, hot dogs or grilled cheese sandwiches. Sometimes he'd order a pizza and then watch one of the movies Tyler loved, the kind with cartoon animals being heroic. Robert wished he could be heroic. His phone rang. He answered before it had time to ring twice. Mr. Stanton, this is Detective Remeres. Did you find him? Robert's heart was pounding in his chest. Not yet, sir, but we have officers out all over the city. We also have use of a dog that has a tremendous track record when it comes to locating missing persons. I know this seems like an irregular request, but do you have some piece of clothing that belongs to your son that we could give to the dog to sniff? An unwashed shirt of his that's in the laundry hamper, maybe? I'm sure I do, yes. Robert was always behind on laundry. He counted it as one of his many failings. But in this case, maybe it could actually be helpful. Well, if it's okay with you, I may come by and get it. Yes, of course. Robert said, trying to keep his voice from breaking. Anything that might help you find him. Once he was off the phone, Robert went into Tyler's room. He looked at Tyler's little toddler bed and thought about all the nights he had peeked into the room and seeing Tyler there, sleeping in that deep, peaceful way that only small children could sleep. He would give anything to see Tyler lying there right now. Anything. He reached into the laundry hamper and pulled out the blue and white striped shirt Tyler had worn just the day before. When he held it up, it seemed impossibly small, like doll's clothes. He held the shirt to his nose and inhaled. Playground dirt. Apple juice. A sweet, hay-like aroma he thought of as little boy smell. His little boy smell 
Robert sat down on Tyler's bed, put his face in his hands, and sobbed. By the time Detective Ramirez arrived to pick up the shirt, Robert had calmed down a little, but his eyes were still red and swollen. I know this is hard, Detective Ramirez said. Probably the hardest thing you've ever been through. But I promise you, we will do all that we can to find your little boy. Try to get some rest, okay? After the officer left, Robert sank back onto the living room couch. This was probably the hardest thing he had ever been through. But losing Anna had been terribly hard too. He knew everybody had some bad things happen to them. But he certainly felt like he had more than his fair share of suffering. His phone vibrated. He clicked on the message icon. The text read, Why don't you go to the cliffs? Robert's anger flashed white hot. Maybe it wasn't so crazy to think the bear was judging him. After all, it was urging him to commit suicide. Well, he wasn't going to have it. He stomped outside of the garbage can where he had dumped the thing. He brought the bear back into the house. Somehow, it made him less nervous to have the thing where he could see it. He hoped he wasn't losing his mind. He was under an unthinkable amount of stress, of course. But he needed to keep it together for Tyler. Rest. Detective Ramirez told him to get some rest. Instead of going back to the couch, Robert walked down the hallway to his bedroom, carrying the bear. He set the bear down on the bed. Looking at it, he felt such a surge of hate for the toy that his stomach roiled. He ran into the bathroom and rushed into the toilet. Though not much came up, he hadn't eaten since breakfast. Breakfast seemed like years ago. Everything had still been normal at breakfast. Everything had been normal until he had brought Tag along Freddy into the house. Back in the bedroom, Robert glared at the offending bear. He drew back his fist and punched it in the face again and again. He quickly became apparent that the punches weren't at all effective. The bear's face would cave in when Robert's fist made contact with it. But then it sprung back into place. Robert wasn't doing it any harm, and the one thing he wanted, other than getting Tyler back home safely, was to harm the bear. Robert grabbed Tagalog Freddy by its ear and carried it downstairs. He went into the kitchen and retrieved the boxes of matches he kept on a high shelf in a cabinet out of Tyler's reach. He carried Freddy outside to the trash can and threw him back in. He struck a match and held it to the bear waiting for it to catch fire. The bear's foot smoldered a little, but refused to burst into flames. It was probably treated with some chemical, Robert thought, to make it flame retardant. A safety feature. Well, he put a stop to that. He grabbed the bottle of lighter fluid he kept near the grill. Robert doused the bear with lighter fluid. Then he struck another match and threw it into the garbage can. Tagalong Freddy went up in a satisfying whoosh of flames. Robert watched it burn for a few minutes, then used his garden hose to extinguish the fire. He didn't want to accidentally burn the whole house down. Once the fire died out, he felt a small amount of relief. He knew it didn't make any logical sense, but he still felt as if destroying the bear would somehow help find Tyler. At the very least, there wouldn't be a voice that kept telling Robert to kill himself. Now he could rest, just like Officer Ramirez had ordered him to. After he made sure the last of the fire was extinguished, he went back to his bedroom, undressed, and crawled under the covers. He was pretty sure there was no way he was going to sleep, but it was still a relief to lie down. He was so exhausted that every bone and muscle in his body felt heavy as lead. He didn't lose consciousness, but lay there in a sort of stupor, his eyes open, but not really seeing. The vibration of the tag long time wristwatch startled Robert. But that was impossible. He had destroyed the bear. It couldn't send him messages anymore. 
Maybe he really was asleep, and this was a dream. Wouldn't it be wonderful if all of this had just been a really bad dream? Robert slapped his own face and felt the sting. He wasn't dreaming. He lifted his arm and looked at the watch. A message from Freddy was flashing. With a shaking hand, he tapped the icon. Why don't you go to the cliffs? No! Robert yelled, clapping his hands over his ears. No! This is impossible! The bear is practically just ashes now! It can't still be telling me to kill myself! It can't be telling me anything! Robert ran outside and lifted the lid of the garbage can. The Freddy doll was charred, but it was still grinning. He reached inside the can and pulled it out. The bear stank of smoke and lighter fluid, and it was singed and blackened in some places, but it was still intact. Robert knew that he spent too much time without adult company since Anna died, and sometimes he felt so sad and lonely that he wondered if he should see a therapist. But now, it seemed, he had moved beyond the need to just talk to a caring professional. The trauma of losing Tyler after losing Anna had caused him to lose something else, his mind. But he had destroyed the bear. He knew what he had seen. When Robert had first seen the bear in the store, he thought it was cute, a nice, cuddly friend for his little boy. But now the bear's once charming smile looked malevolent. Its black eyebrows seemed to slant downward in a classic cartoon depiction of evil. It was all clear now. Robert had brought the bear into the house, and Tyler had disappeared. Tyler's disappearance was the bear's fault. The bear could not continue to exist. Robert fished the car keys out of his pocket. He placed the bear in the driveway in the direct path of his car's left front tire, and then got into the car and settled it. He felt only a slight resistance as he drove over the bear, then put the car in reverse and backed over it. He then ran it over one last time, leaving the bear's body trapped beneath the tire. A fairy fruity pancake. Going back inside the house, he had his phone ringing. How could he be so stupid as to leave his phone inside? This was the exact kind of stupidity that got Tyler kidnapped in the first place. He ran to answer it. Yes? He panted, out of breath. Mr. Stanton, this is Detective Ramirez. Are you okay? It was such an absurd question that he almost laughed. Of course he wasn't okay. His child was missing, and he just spent the past five minutes intentionally running over that child's favorite stuffed toy. These were not the actions of a person who was okay. He decided her question didn't deserve an answer. Instead, he asked the only question that mattered. Did you find him? Not yet, Mr. Stanton, but I wanted to let you know that the dog has his scent now and is searching for him. We also have the tag numbers of every white van in the metro area, and we're running them to see if any of the owners have a history of criminal activity. We're working hard to find your boy. I'll call you in the morning and update you. Morning seemed like years away. How was he going to make it until morning without Tyler? Without even any information about Tyler? Is there anything I should be doing? Stay close to the phone. Get some rest. Pray if you're the praying sort, and stay hopeful. Thank you, Robert said. But really, other than destroying the bear, there was nothing he could do. He was a helpless, hopeless case. Just as he hung up the phone, his wristwatch vibrated. How? he yelled. How? He knew what it was going to say, and he was sorely tempted to run it over, just like the bear. But there was still a tiny chance, wasn't there? The watch might have some connection to Tyler, that it might help locate him some way. He gritted his teeth and tapped a message from Freddy. Why don't you go to the cliffs? Broken, Robert sank to his knees and cried. The more the bear told him to go to the cliffs, the more suicide seemed like a welcome relief from his pain. Sure, it would be terrifying standing on the edge 
looking down at the jagged rocks below, and willing himself to jump. But the fall would be so fast he wouldn't have time to think or feel anything, and the force with which he'd smashed into the rocks would be so hard he would die instantly. Even if there was some physical pain, it would still hurt less than the emotional pain that was ripping him apart. Without Anna and Tyler, what reason did he have to live? If he went to the cliffs, he could join Anna in death. Maybe there was even a possibility he would see her again on some other spiritual plane. And of course, it was possible that Tyler was also... This thought was so horrifying that it sent Robert running back to the bathroom to retch up the non-existent contents of his stomach. He leaned over the toilet, gagging and sobbing. My little boy, my little boy, were the words that played in the loop in his head. He flushed the toilet and stood up straight. He caught a glance of himself in the mirror and was shocked by what he saw. He seemed to have aged ten years in a single day. His complexion was grey, and his eyes were swollen and bloodshot. His face was streaked with tears and snot. On impulse, he turned on the water in the shower. Maybe standing under the spray would calm him down a little, loosen the painful knots in his shoulders. He undressed and stepped into the stall, letting the hot jets of water pound his neck and shoulders. He felt his exhausted mind begin to wander. Tyler's first birthday, knowing the joy that one rules taken destruction, Robert had gotten Tyler a special smash cake he could destroy in addition to a larger birthday cake that Robert could slice and serve. Tyler sat in his high chair, wearing a conical paper birthday hat. When the smash cake was set before him, he cackled with delight and immediately jammed both fists into it. He brought his fist down into the cake again and again, then eventually gave one of his frosting-covered hands an experimental lick. Apparently liking what he had discovered, he dove into the cake face first, coming up with a mouth and a face full of frosting. Robert had filmed the whole thing, laughing. Robert had been so happy that day. He had thought about how that day was the first of many happy birthdays for his son, the first of many birthdays he and Tyler would celebrate together. He had been wrong. Freddy's words echoed in his head. Why don't you go into the cliffs? Two years before the birthday party, Robert and Anna's first anniversary, the official gift for the first wedding anniversary was supposed to be paper. Robert had checked out a book on origami from the library, and after a lot of failures and frustration, had learned how to make origami creams. For weeks, he spent every spare minute he had folding pieces of paper into creams. The night of their anniversary, they had gone to their favorite sushi restaurant, and Robert had presented Anna with a box of 100 origami creams. One crane, he said, for every year of happiness they would have together. Robert had known realistically that he and Anna couldn't possibly have 100 years together, but in his darkest nightmares, he never would have dreamed that they had only one year left. Were some people just doomed to lose everyone they loved? Or was it just Robert's own personal curse? Those words again, why don't you go to the cliffs? Robert stood under the shower until the water ran cold and he started to shiver. He turned off the faucet and grabbed a towel. He dried himself off and put on his bathrobe. But he was still shaking, not just with cold, but with sadness and fear. How could the bear still be threatening him? Hadn't he destroyed it? Robert remembered the line from the description on the toy's packaging. Tagalong Freddy is the bear who is always there. Robert threw on an old t-shirt and a pair of shorts, then grabbed scissors from the bathroom cabinet. He ran out of the house and into the driveway. He yanked the doll out from under his car tire, laid it flat on its back on the hood of the car, and stabbed it over and over and over where its heart would be, if it had a heart.
What do I have to do to make you go away? Robert yelled as he kept on stabbing the little bear. Why won't you just die? You're not even supposed to be alive. The bear's chest was slashed to ribbons. Bits of stuffing poked out from between the tears. Robert was debating ripping out the stuffing when his wristwatch vibrated. He knew what to expect. He knew it would be awful. But the little flutter of hope from somewhere inside him whispered, What if? What if it's news about Tyler? What if I can save him? He took a deep breath and tapped a message from Freddy. Why don't you go to the cliffs? Why don't you go to the cliffs? Why don't you go to the cliffs? Why don't... Robert ripped off the watch and threw it against the pavement, smashing it. Finally, the watch was silent. He picked up the bear and looked in his blank, googly eyes. All of his rage, all of his pain, had turned into a numbness that was somehow even worse. Fine, he said to the bear, feeling more emotionally drained than he had ever felt. We'll go to the cliffs together. It's the only logical thing to do, Robert thought. Robert was empty. He was a shell, like a house that had been so that all of its insides were destroyed. It might not look so bad from the outside, but really, there was nothing left to save. It was time to bring in the wrecking ball. The final demolition was just a formality. He picked up the bear and went into the house. In the kitchen, he filled the cat's food bowl until it was overflowing and put out an extra bowl of water. That should hold Bartholomew until the police discovered Robert's body and came to search the house. The police could turn the cat over to the animal shelter, and the shelter could find it a new home. It had never liked Robert anyway. Robert toyed briefly with the idea of leaving a note, but who would read it? Who would care? If he had anybody left to write a note to, he wouldn't be going to the cliffs in the first place. He grabbed the bear and walked out the front door, leaving it unlocked to make things easier for the police when they arrived to investigate. With Tiger Lung Freddy in hand, he walked toward the cliffs. The night sky was changing from black to an early morning gray. A neighbor whose name Robert couldn't remember was already up for his morning run. He slowed down when he saw Robert and saw the jogging place. Any news about your son? The man asked. The neighborhood gossip machine was apparently working as effectively as usual. Robert couldn't bring himself to speak, so he just shook his head no. I'm sure he's fine, the man said, which Robert knew was a lie. How could this man be so sure when the police didn't even have any information? Let me know if you need anything. Robert knew the man meant well, but really. Let me know if you need anything was an absurd thing to say to someone in Robert's situation. I need my son back, Robert thought. But since the universe is too cruel to let me have that, I need to jump off the cliffs. If you can't help me with either of these things, then you are of no use to me. Goodbye. The man continued his run, and Robert started running in the opposite direction. But Robert wasn't moving like a man getting some exercise. He was running like a man pursued by demons. He made a beeline for the one everybody called Jumpers Cliff, still holding his small stuffed enemy. When he stood at the summit and looked down at the rocky ground far below, it felt like his stomach dropped into his shoes. He had always been afraid of heights, but had always considered it a sensible fear. It wasn't crazy to be afraid of something that could actually kill you. And now, even though death was his goal, he still felt afraid when he looked down. Robert held up the teddy bear and stared at it. This is what you want, right? He asked. Tears clouded Robert's eyes as he thought of Anna, dying on the operating table during what should have been the happiest occasion of their life, the birth of their son. She never would have chosen to make such an early exit from life. She wouldn't have wanted Robert to make an early exit either, especially when, unlike her, he had a choice. The living Robert had been doing since Anna died wasn't really living. Anna wouldn't have wanted that for him either. She wouldn't have wanted him to go out with his co-workers and eat half-priced sushi 
She wouldn't have wanted him to enjoy fatherhood, but also enjoy the company of other grown-ups. Anna had loved life and had loved Robert. She wouldn't have wanted him to give up on himself. And she wouldn't have wanted him to give up on Tyler. And she wouldn't have wanted him to give up on Tyler either. Not when there was even a small hope that he might be alive. He thought of Tyler when he would stretch his arms up and say, Pick me up, Daddy! When he would giggle and say, Daddy, silly! Or when they would play Tickle Monster, or the rhyming game, or read books together. It was easy to get overwhelmed by the daily stresses of parenting. The effort of keeping a child clean and fed and cared for day in and day out. And it was undeniable the will of a toddler often posed a formidable challenge. But the truth was that most of the time he and Tyler spent together was great. He wouldn't trade it for anything. If there was just one small chance he could hear his little boy's voice again. Robert held up the despised bear and stared into its empty eyes. He drew back his arm and pitched the doll as hard as he could over the edge of the cliff. He spat over the ledge in defiance of what the evil toy had almost made him do, of what he had almost let the toy make him do. Tyler wouldn't want me to! Robert screamed after the bear plummeted to the rocks below. His voice echoed, to 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 in the canyon. Robert looked down at the rocks below, but also up at the sky, where the dawn had turned the clouds a rosy pink, the color of a dress Anna used to wear. He always told her that dress brought out the roses in her cheeks. Anna had wanted to live. Tyler, please let him still be alive, Robert thought, wanted to live. The two of them would want Robert to live too. Robert looked down at the rocky ground beneath him and then up at the pink clouds above him. Life was hard, but it could also be beautiful. The two people he loved most in the world wouldn't want him to lose sight of that. As the sun rose, Robert had the early morning chirping of birds and the cry of some small animal he couldn't identify. The mewling of a kitten, perhaps. The cries were coming from below him in one of the many holes that had created shallow miniature cabins in the rock face. The more Robert listened to the cries, he decided they sounded almost human. Could it be? Robert's heart felt as though it might pound right out of his chest. He made his way to the underside of the cliff. He had to resist the dangerous temptation to run. How embarrassing that would be if he decided to live and then fell off the cliff by accident. As he got closer to the cabins, the cries became more distinct. A high keening that could be a wounded animal, but also could be a frightened human child. Robert stood in front of the openings in the rock face, hoping that he would see his son and not a wounded animal that might attack him out of fear. Tyler! He yelled. Tyler, is that you? Daddy! Tyler's voice, weak from crying, came from the hole nearest Robert. Daddy! Daddy! Come get me! The hole wasn't wide enough for Robert's shoulders to fit through. I can't fit in that hole, buddy. You're going to have to come to me. Come to my voice, buddy. You can do it! He could hear scrabbling in the hole. And then, in what it could have been more than a minute, Tyler poked his head out of the rocky opening like some kind of woodland creature. He held out his arms, and Robert scooped him up and hugged him. Tyler was dirty and sweaty from his overnight stay in the caverns, but to Robert, he still smelled sweeter than anything else in the world. You scared me half to death, buddy, Robert said, holding Tyler close. Why in the world did you run off like that? I saw a doggy, Tyler said, like it was the most logical answer in the world. So you tried to follow the doggy and got lost? Uh-huh. Tyler rested his head on Robert's shoulder. Well, that was really dangerous, buddy. You should never leave the yard unless I'm with you. Promise me. You'll never do that again. Okay, Daddy, Tyler said. Robert hoped he meant it. Good. Let's go home. Yeah, carry me, Tyler said. 
and Robert could hear the tiredness in his voice. Okay, buddy. Robert was tired too, but now that he had found his son, he felt like he had the strength to carry him for a million miles. As Robert carefully walked away from Jumper's cliff, Tyler said, Daddy? Yes, buddy? I'm thirsty. I bet you are. We'll get you a big cup of water as soon as we get home. And can I have a peanut, Nana? Sure. Robert knew the kid must be starving. He hadn't eaten since breakfast the day before. Robert was happy to have the opportunity to make Tyler his favorite snack again. Sliced bananas with peanut butter to dip them in. Toddlers like to eat things that they could dip into other things. And I'll make my special mac and cheese for supper, okay? Yummy! Honestly, Robert's mac and cheese wasn't anything special. Just a mix from a blue box. But it would be special because Tyler was back and unharmed and they'd be eating it together. From now on, all that time together would be special. A thought occurred to Robert as they reached the lower cliffs. Hang on just a second, buddy. I wanted to see something. Without getting too close to the edge, Robert peered down in the direction in which he'd thrown tag along Freddy. The little bear was nowhere to be seen. What you see, Daddy? Tyler asked. Nothing, buddy. But look how pretty the sky is. Your mommy used to have addressed the color of those clouds. He decided he would no longer keep silent about Anna. Tyler needed to hear about his mom, just as Robert needed to talk about her. If they talked about her, if they thought about her, there was a way in which she would still be with them. Mommy pretty, Tyler said. Yes, she was, Robert said. Would you like to look at some pictures of your mommy sometime soon? Yeah, Tyler said. Tomorrow, Robert decided, he would take the photos of Anna down from the attic. He could put some on the mantel in the living room, and maybe one in Tyler's room, too. We'll do that tomorrow, then, Robert said. And I can tell you some stories about her, too. Your mommy was very pretty and smart and nice. Daddy's nice, too, Tyler said. It was a high compliment from a two-year-old. Thanks, buddy. I love you, Robert said, holding Tyler securely as he walked farther and farther away from the cliffs. I love you, Daddy. I love you, too, buddy. Robert set Tyler down on the ground. Tyler slipped his hand into his daddy's, and they walked together toward home. And that is the end of story one. Thank you for listening to this read-through of Five Nights at Freddy's, Fazbear Frights number seven. Story one, The Cliffs. I really hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you did, please hit that like button. And if you're new to this channel, why not subscribe for the next story of this novel? Also, make sure you click that bell icon so you'll be notified the next time I post a story. And I'll be back next time with the next story.